Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Sarah Sims and I am the manager of continuing education for the Brown School here at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Thank you all for joining us today for this Open Classroom program. Open Classroom is the Brown School's virtual and free professional development series. Beyond Open Classroom though, we are the largest provider of continu continuing education units in the state of Missouri. So if you're looking for CEUs or just want to engage with us further for deeper learning, I invite you to check out our website, brownschool.wustl.edu under the resources and initiative tabs, uh, where you will find workshops that we offer basically year round on a weekly basis. Um, I'll drop a link to that in the chat. So before we get started, just um, a few quick housekeeping items. Um, this is a Zoom webinar, which just means that we can't see or hear you, but you can engage with us through the chat and we really welcome you to do so. Your comments and especially your questions are invited throughout the program today, and then we will address questions at the end. Um, so please, please feel free to drop those in. Um, we are also live streaming on YouTube and will uh, post a recording to YouTube after uh, probably tomorrow or the next day if you want to reshare the program. All right, so for today's program and speakers, um, Dr. Molly Metzger is a senior lecturer here at the Brown School and serves as chair for the domestic, social, and economic development concentration within the MSW program. She's also a faculty director at the Center for Social Development and a faculty fellow at the Gephardt Institute for Civic and Community Engagement. Dr. Metzger's research focuses on local, state, and federal housing policies, examining how these policies often reproduce patterns of segregation. She strives to build and share research with a host of community partners in order to move housing policy toward the goals of racial equity and economic justice. So today's presentation, which is titled Welcome Home, How Thoughtful Policy Housing Promotes Thriving Communities, is based off of a policy brief that Dr. Metzger developed with um, students in her master's social policy course. So here with her uh, today are Janika Hayden, Mary Stanger, and Russell Beckham, a few of those students who worked on that briefing. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Metzger who will give us some context for that project. And then she'll introduce the students who are really gonna give us the deeper dive into the, the actual work that they did. Um, so I will be quiet and uh, Dr. Metzger and, and uh, Janika, Russell and Mary, please take it away. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and thanks for everyone who's on the call today and who's watching this after the fact. Um, it really gives me a lot of hope um, that so many people are interested in these issues of um, inclusive and equitable housing. Um, so as Sarah said, this uh, presentation today really came out of a collaboration in fall 2022, and it was a Master's of Social Work class called Social and Economic Development Policy. And this was a class that partnered with um, a number of community organizations that I also really want to thank today. The Alliance for Interracial Dignity in Webster Groves, Women's Voices Raised for Social Justice, and Webster Groves Mayor, Laura Arnold. Um, and there were all in all, you know, probably about 30 people involved in putting our heads together to think about what some really specific and concrete and winnable housing solutions might look like, um, specifically for St. Louis County municipalities like Webster Groves, Clayton, Maplewood, and places like that. So these are sort of entering, um, you know, middle class, uh, upper middle class, disproportionately white suburbs of St. Louis. So the housing solutions we'll be talking about today um, were designed, you know, thinking with uh, those sorts of places in mind, but we're hoping that some of these solutions also, regardless of where you're from, um, some of them might be applicable or might be sort of tailored to fit the housing conditions um, where you live. So we're happy to discuss those sorts of questions in the Q&A at the end. Um, in addition to thanking our community partners for this project, I really wanted to thank the Center for Social Development, who has been a great partner. Um, they published the policy briefing book that accompanies this presentation, which uh, Sarah will share in the chat. And they also previously helped us with a project um, regarding building a community land trust um, in Webster Groves. So the students put together presentations on four specific policy solutions. 
um, thinking about you know inclusive and affordable and equitable housing. Um, to, today we're going to talk about three of them just for lack of time. So, but the fourth is um, thinking about community land trusts, and we have additional materials uh, available on that topic that we we would love you to check out as well. Um, and then the last thank you I want to say is to all of the students. So again, this was really a group effort with I would say about 18 or 20 students who are represented by um, by three of them today, Janika, Russell, and Mary. So um, thanks to all of them. And um, with that, I will hand it over to Mary. I'll just get her slides up and running. All right. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Um, as Molly said, my name is Mary Stinger. I was one of the students in the Social and Economic Development Policy course. Um, I also just wanted to shout out, we did kind of the framing, my group kind of did like the framing of the issue, um, and then kind of let the other groups talk about the solutions. So I just wanted to shout out my other group members, Ashley Red, Bethany Copeland, and Jasmine Brooks for really helping with this presentation, um, especially this part about framing. So I wanted to start with a quote from, and a local story from Heather McGee's book, The Summer Bus. Um, and the quote is, we often think about the benefits of wealthy neighborhoods, good schools, low crime rates, high property values, um, but what is the cost of exclusionary practices? In our region's history, we have an answer to this question. We all lose when we choose to exclude some rather than um, include all of us. So St. Louis used to have the world's largest swimming pool in Fairgrounds Park um, between 1912 and 1949. It welcomed around 10,000 people per day, um, but when the city decided that it needed to be desegregated, um, violence erupted, white youth attacked black youth who came to swim, a riot between hundreds of people ensued and six people were seriously injured, five of whom were Af who were African-American. Over the next five years, attendance at the pool declined by 80% and the pool ultimately closed. Rather than everyone benefiting from an expansive city pool, everyone in the city lost a valuable amenity when some chose the comfort and pleasure of a few over the good for all. I think there might be a problem with the slides. Hold on one second. Sorry. Let's see if this is any better. Okay. Um, Hopefully you can see the slide. Sorry if you could not see the slide I was talking about earlier. Um, it just had the quote and then it had a picture of Fairgrounds Pool on it, um, if you couldn't see that before. So now going to framing the problem through history. So housing policies have been racialized for the past hundred years. St. Louis voters overwhelmingly passed a citywide segregation ordinance in 1916, even though it was made unconstitutional the following year. De facto segregation through racial covenants continued where, homeowner, where homeowners added legal contracts to never to refuse sale of home to a black person. And Janika is gonna talk about that in a little bit. Black residents were steered away from white neighborhoods when seeking housing and planners cited highways to further isolate black neighborhoods. Other laws like redlining codified racial and systemic oppression Redlining was a neighborhood ranking system starting in the 1930s by the Homeowners Loan Corporation. Their grades were from A to Z, A to D, A representing the best areas and given a green color, um, kind of go for funding opportunities, and D represented a hazardous and giving, given a red color, meaning stop and signifying not giving funding. Neighborhoods where residents were African American, Asian American, Latinx, or immigrants were far more likely to receive D or C grades. These maps and ratings set the rules for decades of real estate practices and the results remain apparent today. So the map on the left shows a redlining map from St. Louis in 1937. And then the photo on the right shows the Center for Disease Control Social Vulnerability Index for census tracts today. Um, so the SVI combines a number of factors, social and economic, housing and transportation, minority status and language, household composition and disability to assess a community's capacity to prepare for, respond to, respond to and, resp and recover from human and natural disasters, 
And so these photos show that not, on, not only little has changed in regards to economic and housing opportunities, but also how these affects social determinants of health. According to a 2016 report, redlining continues to be a reality. So this table shows that homes that were located in the best neighborhoods in the 1930s continue to be inhabited by an overwhelming majority of middle to upper class households and that those deemed hazardous are still most likely to, li to be lived in by low to moderate income households. Table three shows that those that were classified as best also continue to be inhabited by mostly white people and that red line neighborhoods deemed hazardous continue to have a majority of residents from racial and ethnic minorities. Redlining was one but not only policy policies that created inequity by segregation and division. Exclusionary zoning laws place restrictions on the types of homes that can be built in a particular neighborhood. Common examples are minimum lot size requirements, minimum square footage, prohibitions on multifamily homes, and limits of the height on the buildings. St. Louis County contains a high percentage of single family homes with few options for more affordable options like apartments or attached homes. So a local example of how exclusionary zoning impacted the region is shown in the documentary Displaced and Erased. Clayton, Missouri had a thriving black community that was zoned out and erased in the late 1950s. Um, community planners had a vision that it would become an upper class community. Um, they were bought out at market prices but were excluded from the benefits of living in a developing town. And the wealth gap in this country is because of the decisions in the 1950s and 60s that did not allow black people to build wealth in community. This graphic depicts current housing trends specifically in the seven municipalities that were represented when we originally presented this presentation and the geography of inequity to use language from a 2018 report titled segregation in St. Louis dismantling the divide. According to the Zillow home value index in 2022 there's a large discrepancy between municipalities like Clayton where the average home estimate is almost $800,000 in the city of St. Louis, where the average home estimate is less than $200,000. Nationally, in 2019, Black home ownership in the United States was lower than it was when segregation was legal. In St. Louis in 2019, white residents were twice as likely as Black residents to be homeowners, according to the St. Louis Affordable Housing Report Card. Additionally, Black applicants were still more than twice as likely to be denied a home improvement loan than white applicants and three times as likely to be denied a home mortgage loan than white applicants, most frequently on the basis of their credit history. As we move in to talk about the specific housing policies that enhance affordable housing, we first want to define affordable housing and talk and dispel three affordable housing myths. Affordable housing includes all residential structures, newly constructed or rehabilitated, where a perning, person earning 115% or less of the area median income could afford it if spending 29% of, of that person's gross income annually on such housing. AMI stands for Area Median Income by Census Tract and is determined by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development every year. 115% of AMI comes from the USDA loan program that classifies moderate income as typically making 115% or less of the median income for your geographic reason, region. Housing is generally considered affordable when a household pays less than 30% of their income on housing costs. We also wanted to highlight that there is a need for affordable housing in St. Louis County. So according to 2019, around 107 households in St. Louis County were housing cost burden, meaning that they spent more than 30% of their income on housing costs. And we also wanna highlight that this statistic was before the pandemic began. And we know that the pandemic has really highlighted disparities that already existed. So it may be a vastly different number. So to just quickly go through the three affordable housing myths. The first myth is that affordable housing lowers home values. Um, and the truth is that there is no adverse effects on the neighborhood's real estate market. And there's no measurable, no measurable effect um, on the ability to sell your property if you wanted to leave if you didn't live in affordable housing. Other homes will sell just as quickly for the same price that they would in any other area. And then UCI Livable Cities Lab also published that from 2001 
to 2020, there was a consistent modest increase in both of the sales and price per square footage of homes sold within two miles of affordable housing developments. The second myth is that affordable housing burdens taxpayers and municipalities. The truth is that affordable housing enhances local tax revenues. So the National Association of Home Builders found that building 100 affordable rental homes generates almost $12 million in local income, 2.2 million in taxes and other re revenue for local governments and created 161 local jobs in the first year alone. The third myth is that affordable housing only benefits low income folks. And the truth is people that are in fact, people that are impacted by a lack of affordable housing and stand to benefit from the expansion include childcare workers, social workers, police officers, and teachers, many other professions as well, but these are workers that are in every single community that would benefit from a program like this. Um, researchers also estimate that the growth in GDP between 1964 and 2009 would have been 13.5% higher if families had better access to affordable housing. That would be almost 1.7 trillion increase in income or an additional 8,775 additional wages per worker. Now I'm going to hand it over to Janika. I'll get the slides going here. Sorry if there were some technical difficulties with the slides before. I wanted to just say one quick thing. Um, if you're new to this housing landscape and um, our, your head is spinning a little bit with a lot of the terminology that Mary just introduced, I wanted to recommend the National Low Income Housing Coalition's um, Advocates Guide, NLIHC is the organization, and they have an Advocates Guide that has a really helpful glossary. So when you're thinking about terms like AMI, the area median income, um, Mary talked about you know, that affordable housing, you might consider it up to 115% of AMI to be affordable. Well, we actually know through the research that the greatest need is really much lower than that, people making like 30%. Uh, or thereabouts of the area median income. So uh, it gets technical quick, but I just wanted to share that reference as well. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Janika. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Mary. Um, I'm Janika Hayden. Uh, I worked on the racial and restrictive covenants portion of the presentation, um, along with my classmates, Fadia, Livy, and Logan. Um, and our part of the presentation was more so level setting for the historical aspects and how we got here today regarding segregation, both in the city and the county through racially restrictive covenants. Um, next slide, Molly. Thank you. Um, so racially restrictive covenants are legally binding agreements that were placed into property deeds and other legal documents to ban um, non-white people, which kind of fluctuated um, in the early 1900s, depending on what ethnic group you came from, um, but they were living in certain neighborhoods. So those were targeted by these racially restrictive covenants to include black and brown people, um, as well as um, Jewish people, Italian people, and Polish people up until a certain point. Um, and just to highlight the social and the legal definition of white people, like I said, evolved over time based on immigration trends and Supreme Court cases. Um, and as referenced in the Confronting Racially Restrictive Covenants Collaboration Project, at the heart of these covenants were really the, uh, the ability to cast like a large swath of impact that superseded personal attitudes towards race, um, which was basically packaged and sold as another measure that would prevent homes from losing their values. Um, so it didn't seem overtly racist. Um, the next slide, Molly. Um, so just quickly, what is a deed? Um, a deed is a legal tangible document that is transferred from property owner to property owner during the sale of a transaction. Um, and this is where previous current um, HOA boards, developers, um, and anybody that is involved in the selling of a property, they can insert any type of language into a covenant that has to be abided by that owner or a, a whole neighborhood. Um, and this historically was one of the vehicles outside of zoning ordinances that allowed um, exclusionary segregation practices to persist before the 50s and well beyond um, after it became illegal in the 50s. Um, and deeds are usually recorded at the courthouse or the office of the recorder, depending on the locale, um, and our permanent record that follows each property. So that's how we're still able to see the racially restrictive language. Um, so really briefly, an overview of the city of St. Louis and how they utilize the covenants. Um, so they came to St. Louis primarily because of white flight and mass migration. Um, 
St. Louis had a fair share of migrants, but due to the local industrial industry, a lot of Black people migrated from the South to St. Louis. Um, and the response was sculpting out ways to separate white people and Black people from undesirable, I mean, from neighborhoods in, based on language who seemed undesirable. Um, so people in the city petitioned to have their blocks or neighborhoods restricted off um, and they fled to what is current day, I'm sorry, they fled to what's current day St. Louis County. Um, St. Louis County in specific kind of carved itself out as a safe haven um, for people to flee to and they organized into municipalities, which the, all of the ones we see today um, for some of the language that they use wholly for the Caucasian race. Um, so these covenants were prevailing in the inner suburbs, uh, such as Clayton, New City, Ferguson, and extended as far west as Ladue and Huntley, um, Eureka, and Pacific. Um, and they also stretched north initially to Pine Lawn um, and Uplands Park. Um, these issues, initially, I'll show you maps in the following slides, but these issues really weren't prevalent up until like the 1900s because the residents because St. Black residents weren't really in St. Louis City, um, but by 1900, Black residents peaked at about 35,000, and that's when we'll see a whole, um, the resident racial restrictive covenants popping up all over the city. Um, in 1948, though, the Supreme Court case, Shelley versus Kramer, outlawed this happening in the city of St. Louis. Um, as a small refresher, Shelley was a person that was living in the north side of St. Louis. Um, there was a re restrictive covenant on her house. Um, the Kramers, which were their neighbors, um, sought to enforce the racially restrictive covenants that was in their deeds, challenging the family in court, and then which matriculated to the Supreme Court. And then the majority opinion held that this is a violation of the 14th Amendment. Um, so initially, well, in 1948, they were legally outlawed, but as we'll continue to see that the practices continue. Um, next slide, Molly. So they they come in different forms and variations. Um, they're also known as indentures, um, which are legal documents created through both public and private stakeholders, such as landlords, the federal government, homeowner associations, real estate companies, and developers. The most pervasive in St. Louis County were subdivision restrictions. And the most pervasive in the city were um, petitions that restrict the petitions that would petition off a whole block that wouldn't allow certain people to live on the that street. Um, yeah, we can go to the next one. And the petition process involved like a collecting signatures. So going door to door and still confusing the neighbors and saying, um, we don't want this type of population in our city. So this is a map from 1810 on the left to 1910 on the right. Um, sorry, I'm trying to zoom in. This shows in 1890 on the left, there were not many, uh, not many of these type of petitions um, being utilized, but by 1910, the green represents uh, private streets that people um, began to file. So private streets was a different way that they could enforce who could stay on that street. So by 1910, when people started to migrate up to St. Louis, um, so private streets began to pop up, but not so much the petitions uh, or private subdivisions just yet. The next map shows 1920 to 1930. The map on the left is 1920 and the yellow is signifying how different subdivisions came to be, uh, which are all in the current day county. Um, and as you can see, the darker shade of gray shows where Black people are concentrated, which was primarily in the city of St. Louis. And then there's a couple of petitions um, in the city as well, but mostly people are starting to sprawl west. Um, in 1930, in the city, uh, the petition, the petitions are starting to ramp up more. Um, and then there's more subdivisions being created out west. But the concentration of Black people is still primarily in like current current day downtown, midtown, um, and then white people stay still a little bit further west of the city. But all of the red is where the petitions were started, and then the darker shades of gray are where black people were mostly concentrated in the city. Um, the next map is 1940 to 1950, just showing the same thing and how uh, more subdivisions were being created and how more white flight began. On the right is 1950, there's more subdivisions and then more petitions in the city to carve out certain neighborhoods. 
The next slide shows a sample of an initiative petition um, that people, certain people in the neighborhood or certain elected officials even, or certain um, like HOA officials would go and collect signatures and say, hey, this is what we want on this neighborhood. And if they got a majority of signatures, then it would be initiated. Um, I'm gonna read you some of the language of the petition just to show what people were saying to garner support. Um, the first line is this indenture made the 24th day of April, 1939, by and between the subscribing owners of land situated in the blocks 4406E um, of the city of St. Louis for the parties of, this is the name, these are the people that were filing the petitions. Um, whereas the subscribers here to are the owners of various parcels of land in the district situated between said blocks. So they were carving out where they wanted the petition to start and in. Um, a little bit further down is just some of the names that they gathered um, in support of the petition. The next slide is a different, sorry, my screen is different, um, is the same petition, I'm sorry, but at the bottom, it, the language is a little bit more clear. Um, it says, and whereas it, it is to the mutual benefit and advantage of all of the parties of the first part to reserve the character of said neighborhood as a desirable place of residence for persons of the Caucasian race and to maintain the values of their respective properties. And to that end, they just that they desire to restrict the use and de the position of their several said parcels to land for the benefit of all parties of the first part, their heirs and successors and assigns in the manner here and after set forth. Um, so this was done by the St. Louis Real Estate Exchange. The St. Louis Real Estate Exchange, a corporation of set which trustees are responsible for the president and so on. So this was done by that corporation to garner signatures um, for an initiative petition process. Um, the next slide is just further language, um, outline what they didn't want in that neighborhood. Um, the second line says um, they should not sell, convey, lease, or rent to a Negro or any Negroes or deliver possessions to or to permit be occupied by a Negro or any Negroes, no matter how the right to occupancy or title shall be attempted to be acquired, any of the said parcels of land belonging to parties of the first part or herein above described or any part thereof or any interest therein. Um, so you are not to sell your property um, to, to anybody of the Negro race trying to move into that said neighborhood. The next slide um, is showing different blocks that were petitioned to be restricted in 1952. Martin Luther King Drive and most of the surrounding streets had covenants obtained by the petition process by this time. Um, the next slide is just another organization, the United Welfare Organization that organized and sent out a lot of mailers to a lot of residents to warn them of the danger and the invasion of the Negro race. Um, it was a collaboration project with a couple of a couple of other stakeholders in the city, um, but they were one of the main drivers to get people to sell their homes or keep their neighborhoods um, to preserve the integrity of the neighborhood or the street. Um, the next slide is just the UWA again. This is a postcard by them. Um, just saying, hey, look, look at these homes and you want to preserve this by keeping the Negroes out. Um, and then at the top, every X, every X at the top shows how uh, Black people are in those homes. So they were saying, save your home from, vote for segregation, save your home so we can stop the spread um, of Black people invading our neighborhoods, basically. Um, the next slide is just St. Louis briefly today. Um, the city, of course, is very hyper segregated um, and which in turn creates pockets of concentrated poverty. Um, Black people are largely locked out of wealth building due to housing discrimination mechanisms such as redlining um, that was partnered with racially restrictive covenants. Um, there are currently 30,000 covenants that are still on the books in the city. Um, but last year, Governor Parson did sign, in, um, sign House Bill 1662, which mandates the removal of racially restrictive language in covenants in all newly reported deeds. So if you have a home, from my understanding, if you have a current home with any racially restrictive language in your covenant, it's up to you to get that removed, but you still have to um, pay to get it removed um, through your local recorder's office. 
Um, but there are a few municipalities that are taking steps uh, to address the racially restrictive that covenants that are still present in their communities. Um, EHOC is working on this in partnership with Professor Colin Gordon, who's done a lot of work on racially restrictive covenants in the city um, to address this and come up with recommendations. The next slide um, just talks about Clayton a little bit. Clayton established a equity commission um, and they're working to identify and address racially restrictive covenants in the city of Clayton. Um, they have said that uh, Clayton is a community that's welcome to all, no matter the race they may be. Um, but this is only a start because Clayton has a lot more to do regarding equity building um, in their city. So even though racially restrictive covenants are illegal, um, there are still some solutions that could be addressed moving forward to target some of the harm that they have made due to racial segregation. Um, so some of the solutions our group came up with uh, include historical landmarkers that com commemorate uh, historically low, historically black neighborhoods, such as areas that, re that were referenced on our earlier maps, um, community land trust with subsidies from city budgets, um, acknowledgement statements on city municipality websites. Um, the next slide is discharging of covenants and including pro, pro fair housing covenants. Um, eliminate any fees that are associated with um, eliminating racial language in deeds because most places you have to pay to get that language taken out of your deed. Um, there's a lot of debate. If, there's a lot of debate amongst historians um, if the if the language should be taken out due to um, kind of whitewashing of history. Um, so another another place in New York, I want to say, they came up with the solution that if you want if they wanted to discard the documents of racial language. Um, they had to properly digitize them and support it by legislation. Um, and then just educate your own communities on the newly passed legislation in Missouri and encourage people to seek um, to seek to vacate the covenants. Um, there are a couple of examples. Uh, Rochester, New York has an anti-covenant notice called racial calling racial covenants illegal and racist, where they have been posted in places where deeds can be viewed in the public. Um, and then they put an anti-covenant warning. Um, they put an anti-covenant warning that placed on the login feature of the city county clerk's website. Um, Delaware digitizes the entire deeds now that includes racist language and stores it within an online database that requires special permission to view. So you can't view it publicly. Um, you have to get special permission to view it. Um, but the public version does have a notice at the full deed that pertains racial language can be accessed with special permission online. Um, and just some parting thoughts, um, you know, as we work towards a more equitable society, reconciliation, acknowledgement of the past has to happen first. Um, and, and just for stakeholders or people in your own communities, like what does this look like for your community and what steps can your own community take um, and what are the benefits in that? And, um, Sorry, and what improvements does your community have uh, to make improvements regarding zoning reform, local housing ordinances, and what can you all do to make affordable housing a priority in your community? And that's all from my part. I'm not sure who's next, it might be Molly. Yeah, I will be taking it from here. Thank you so much, Janika, for that really important history and your clear-eyed analysis of that history uh, and your call to action. So, um, I will be presenting the next section, um, but I wanna give credit where it's due. Olivia Borland, Casey Kolstruck, and Lindsay Owens um, developed this part of the presentation um, and the accompanying um, section of the policy briefing packet. Um, and this part of the presentation focuses on zoning. So these are local laws um, that determine what land can be used for. Is it for residential or commercial or industrial uses and, um, and I'm going to try to explain how these sorts of laws play into the same pattern of racism that Mary and Janika were describing um, from the previous you know, generations. So what is zoning? Um, zoning is a tool used by urban planners to divide land into different areas for different purposes. Each development area has a different set of regulations that dictate what can be built and what buildings should look like. So when we're talking about residences, um, zoning will determine how big a lot 
can be and how big a house can be on that lot, um, as well as is this you know single family zoning or multifamily zoning and issues like that. Originally, the purpose of zoning was uh, to protect public health. So for instance, you wouldn't want to build housing immediately next to you know, an industrial place that is a high polluting um, facility. Um, but it evolved to include really a fundamental protection of property rights um, and is now very much seen as a legal extension of redlining um, and restrictive covenants and policies like we've been discussing um, so far in this presentation. So even though the language, the contemporary language of zoning um, does not include any mention of you know, sort of racialized or ethnic sort of categories, um, because these laws are playing into patterns of ownership um, that were established in previous generations um, that secluded, um, that basically allowed white people to self-segregate and build wealth um, while denying those um, sort of privileges to people of color, especially African-Americans, this um, notion of zoning becomes racialized, even if not in the, uh, the sort of actual language of the, of the laws. Um, so again, in terms of just the basics of what is zoning, um, zoning uh, basically lays the landscape for what sorts of um, buildings can be built. Is it residential, commercial, industrial, some kind of mix, um, some kind of special district? Um, and we'll talk a little bit later about how there's sort of this missing middle um, that we have uh, very common zoning categories for single family housing or um, higher density multifamily housing, but there aren't a lot of areas that are zoned for sort of duplexes, smaller homes, and sort of that um, middle kind of category. And um, these slide, this slide provides some pictures of what these different types of density actually look like from a bird's eye view. So um, this is an example of what low density housing looks like. You can see how large these lots are and how large the homes are within each lot. Um, here you have more of a um, middle density kind of arrangement with townhomes, smaller lots. Um, and then I guess this is the example, it's a little bit hard for me to see, I'll be honest, but um, of a higher density area where you have not just, you know, townhomes or duplexes, but more multifamily buildings and really a higher, more kind of urban um, level of density. So what are some of the problems um, related to zoning? So a big issue here has to do with the minimum lot sizes. So throughout the county, you can look up the maps and see um, you know, what sort of housing is allowed to be built. And especially in the wealthier parts of our region, we have very large minimum lot sizes. Um, and it means higher costs and it's, um, you are not allowed to build a duplex or a modest home. Um, and it's having a, uh, basically perpetuating the problems that were um, established in previous generations. Um, alongside that issue of lot sizes um, are our building codes. So the building codes are the rules and restrictions around parking, open space, and the built structure itself. So for instance, height limitations, um, as well as um, regulations that, re that require certain types of um, design features in homes um, so that you so that a neighborhood maintains sort of its its character and these things can really add up and there's sort of an increasing a, a growing literature on this um, suggesting that they can add up to 23 percent of a house the regulatory costs of um, building a home and so again what this leads to is really a, a missing middle where we're just building a lot of you know high-end um, low density housing in a lot of our region um, and really not meeting the demand for housing. So again, if the yellow line here is the housing demand, this, these are national figures, um, and the blue is the housing supply, um, you don't have to be an economist to know that when you have um, such a high ratio of demand to supply, um, that prices are gonna go up and not, and not be affordable for most people. So again, um, in terms of thinking of zoning as a tool for exclusionary um, housing policy, Elizabeth Winkler has had towns with the most stringent rules tend to have lower density and be wealthier than those with less regulation. The laws do not specifically mention race, 
But because African Americans and Latinos have an, on average far less wealth and income than white people, again, due to the history that we've been discussing this afternoon, the laws do tend to drive people of color out and keep neighborhoods more uniformly white. So I'm gonna just say a few words about some of the solutions here. I know we're kind of running short on time. But essentially, um, the solutions have to do with changing what is allowed to be built. Um, Upzoning means adjusting zoning co codes to allow for increased density um, and to reduce or remove minimum lot sizes. And again, I've been talking about this missing middle. There are a lot of different ways it can look and you know what's um, maybe appropriate or feasible for one community might not be feasible for another community, but there are a lot of options here to build out this missing middle. Um, another um, part of this is the accessory dwelling unit. So, you know, again, sort of allowing for a wider range of housing types um, and thinking creatively around um, what can be built and the price point um, at which things are built. So I want to briefly mention, though, that there can be unintended consequences with up zoning. Again, depending on where this is happening, it could have the unintended consequence of heating up the housing market. Just because you have density doesn't mean that it's affordable density, right? We could just be building a bunch of, you know, million dollar condos, and that's not solving the problems that we're setting out to solve. So there are additional policies that could be implemented to try to um, compensate for those unintended consequences. Um, and the ones that we want to focus on here are inclusionary zoning that's requiring in multi um, family developments, some set aside of units for um, you know, as affordable housing at specific price points, for instance, at 30% of the AMI. Um, racial equity analyses, that's really being intentional around, um, you know, who's benefiting and who's potentially being harmed by any policies um, that we are considering and thinking about the racialized implications of those, um, as well as property tax relief. So if you are running the risk of heating up the housing market um, and potentially pricing out, um, especially, lower income, older homeowners who might ho own their homes outright, um, but be facing higher property taxes, you can develop programs, and we've done this um, in the city of St. Louis, to help people to manage those costs. So there's a lot more to say here, but we are running a little short on time. So I want to hand it off to Russell next to talk about the solution of linkage fees. And I think the best way to advance is by using that arrow. Hi everyone, my name is Russell Beckham. I go by he, him pronouns. Um, and me, along with my crew, um, including Lillian Murphy and Stafford Cooper, um, gave this presentation on linkage fees, which is an equitable housing development solution to finance the increase of affordable housing within areas that have linkage fees. Apologies for the technical difficulty. Yeah. Okay, so to get started, um, this map shows St. Louis County and St. Louis City, and the areas in gray um, have under 1% of affordable housing available. Um, the red box shows um, municipalities such as Clayton, um, Richmond Heights, and Webster Groves as within that gray area with under 1% prevalence of affordable housing. Um, so what are linkage fees? Linkage fees are known as um, housing impact fees as well, and are tools that generate revenue to support the creation of affordable housing by charging a fee on new or proposed developments. Um, and so a concrete example of this would be a city which would implement a linkage fee of $12 per square foot on a new development, um, of which for say $8 will be dedicated to affordable housing and $4 will be allocated to workforce training or another public service. Um, this example is taken from the city of Boston. Um, just to show that linkage fees are not new, um, they're prevalent throughout the country, um, and Boston's linkage fee has been in place for about 40 years, um, amassing over $200 million um, for the city's budget through linkage fees. Um, and so in St. Louis, um, our group is wondering what this would look like. Um, and use Clayton as one example. So these are five proposed developments for the city of Clayton, um, each with square foot and estimated cost. Um, and we used a linkage fee of $1.50 as just a variable fee we set ourselves. 
um, as a very low uh, moderate estimate for a linkage fee. Um, again, the past example was a linkage fee of 12, um, sometimes $15 for a linkage fee. Um, and so this fee of $1.50 would um, add up to about $2 million um, for the city of Clayton to use for affordable housing. Russell, could you speak up just a little bit? We have someone in the chat asking you to just talk a little bit louder. Okay. Um, and so this is proposed development for Richmond Heights, um, also to show the prevalence of linkage fees in other areas of St. Louis. Um, and for this single development, it would generate about half a million dollars um, with that same fee of $1.50. Um, with linkage fees, um, some of the benefits, this is a five points to benefits and linkage fees. Um, one being, again, the increase of affordable housing. Um, two being, uh, it can help fund other policies such as community land trusts and affordable housing trust funds. Um, three being that it can be legislative and enforced as a policy at the local level or within a group of municipalities. Um, and then as a concept, um, oftentimes development um, has an impact past um, just the development itself. And so linkage fees are a mitigation fee and not a tax to account for the impact development has on affordable housing um, and to have them pay a fair share towards public services. And so again, as we saw in 2008 in the market crash, a lack of regulation is often the problem um, not more regulation, and so regulatory requirements such as linkage fees um, are able to protect the environment, workers, and communities, and increase economic activity overall. Um, the first recommendation in a linkage fee would be a nexus study, um, which would essentially quantify the impact um, that a development has on affordable housing, um, and also would be able to set um, the linkage fee itself as an estimate. Um, and so these are not necessarily an requirement because linkage fee is a policy, um, but it would provide um, legality to how the linkage fee is set um, and also can be extensive. Um, but because again, this is not a new policy, um, there are other communities that have implemented linkage fees and nexus studies to draw off of. Um, so within that nexus study, um, a linkage fee could be set by the example, um, which is a formula based on square footage. Um, this is the most common option for setting a linkage fee. Um, others may include a formula based on a per unit basis of buildings um, or a percentage of the sales price for residential housing. Um, and important stages of the linkage fee, of course, are community engagement, which would be present through the entire implementation policy proposal and beginning stages of the linkage fee. Um, and in closing, um, I'm gonna give questions to consider of how could a linkage fee be implemented between municipalities in St. Louis? How can an affordable housing trust fund um, be strengthened and maintained through the development of linkage fees? Um, and how could the county and municipal municipalities develop a framework um, for affordable housing rates, um, which could be the basis of linkage fees and quantitatively understanding the impact um, that affordable housing has in um, using linkage fees for, as a policy solution. Um, and so I wanna close out by thanking everyone for attending this webinar and open to questions. Um, I'll bring Molly back in as well. Um, and thank you so much. Thanks, Russell. So we covered a lot of ground in a pretty short period of time. Um, what questions do we have? Yeah, Molly, um, I can, I'm happy to feed those to you. There's actually a lot. We probably won't have uh, time for all of them, but I do want to start with, um, you know, you guys presented some really great macro level policy recommendations and somebody had more of kind of like an individual micro level question. Um, just asking, you know, wanting to take action on their own homes. If, if there are people here who want to find out if their home has a racially restrictive covenant tied to it, where can we go to find that out about our own properties? Janika, do you want to speak to that one or shall I? 
I don't want to be wrong, but I'm almost certain um, either look in your, your deed itself or the the registrar should have it, like the, the registrar of property deeds. It should be there. Um, if there is, now not every home has restrictive language in it, but if there is, the deed follows every homeowner. So if there is um, language in the deed, it should be there. And again, um, Janika had mentioned the work of Colin Gordon. Colin oh, Gordon yes. has worked really closely with Kalila Jackson at EHOC, which is a great regional organization here in St. Louis, EHOC. It's the St. Louis Equal Housing and Opportunity Council. Um, and they have, there's been some work, a ton of mapping work done. And I believe that one of their maps that was um, published in the Post-Dispatch is searchable. So if we can dig that up, link we can to share them. that as well. Yeah. But I would say, um, you know, if you're digging it up or calling the assessor's office, can't find it, um, or the recorder of deeds and can't can't find the information, um, I think EHOC, at, at risk of overwhelming uh, Kalila at EHOC, I'll say that, you know, she's one of the go-to sources here in the St. Louis region. I also dropped a link to um, some more information, some more work by Colin Gordon called Mapping the Decline. But on this website, it has an interactive map um, where you can go and look to see. I'm sorry, it's maps. You can just go and see map out where some of this stuff happened. I don't know if you can look up individual deeds on his, but I'll drop the link so people could look through his website. Thank you so much for those resources. Um, another question we have, and some of the, you know, the policy recommendations that you all put together and that Russell shared at the end um, kind of allude to, you know, the fractured environment of St. Louis and that there's all these different municipalities um, and the, the divide between the city and county. And, you know, somebody commented on the need for more of a regional approach. And I just wonder if you all um, have more comments about that, you know, and, and how you would recommend that the city works together with the county and all of the different municipalities to ensure that there's a coordinated effort and maybe how important that it that is. Or is it enough for individual municipalities to, to take individual steps? So I definitely think that this is a regional problem that requires regional solutions. I think, you know, um, it's a really complicated problem. And so on like on any given day, we might focus on like the local issues, the regional issues. I mean, we could have a totally different webinar focusing on the federal issues and sort of the outsized role of, um, of banks and private equity and, you know, like who actually owns our neighborhoods. So there are a lot of places to intervene. Um, I saw another comment. I haven't been able to keep track of everything in the chat, but I saw someone talking about, why are you focused on Webster and St. Louis County instead of the Ville and other city neighborhoods? And I wanna say, we definitely are um, working with those neighborhoods as well in different classes like this. This today just happens to focus on um, you know, this set of municipalities, but um, the approach that um, Russell just described of linkage fees could definitely be used to, for instance, um, start to fund the St. Louis County Affordable Housing Trust Fund, um, and then be used to invest, you know, in neighborhoods across the county. So these sorts of um, solutions are extremely important. St. Louis County does have um, an affordable housing strategy, but there's been a lot of uh, turnover within, you know, in terms of who's running housing, community development in St. Louis County. And so I think, and it's also been some hard years during the pandemic and everything, and we've um, then, you know, rolling out some programs like the emergency rental assistance program and things like that. But my hope is that, you know, in the coming years, we'll kind of turn back to that um, affordable housing trust fund and the, and the, at least the county strategy, if not a regional strategy quite yet. But again, if you want to learn more about that, the affordable, the St. Louis um, County, I believe it's called the affordable housing commission in the county is where those sorts of conversations are happening. Can I add to that, Molly? Mm -hmm, please. A lot. We talked a lot in class because some of the students had the same question. Why are we focusing on the county instead of the city? Because the city has a lot of pervasive, pervasive issues. Um, and what I remember the question, the answer to that question being is the county, the county kind of absolves itself from some from some of these issues and postures like they don't have a role to play um, in addressing affordable housing in their own in their own backyards. Um, it's a lot of initiative going on in the city to address affordable housing and some of the historical instances that happen in the city, but the county 
I think Molly, it was a call of action for the county to do more um, regarding their role in the issues that we uh, talked about today. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for those thoughts and answers. Um, another question here about kind of the intersection of like housing, affordability and availability and all of that as well as just kind of livability. And I wonder what you all think about other policies such as transportation, um, how those things you know, intersect with this um, for, the, for the larger purpose of you know, racial, racial and economic equity in our neighborhoods and, and region as a whole. You know, how does um, access to um, you know, buses and other, other forms of um, shared transportation intersect with the work that you all are doing. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's vitally important. We need public transportation. We need better public transportation for so many reasons, um, economic reasons, climate reasons, other environmental reasons. Um, and I think one of the challenges is that, you know, and I, and I, it's, I hesitate to talk anything about San Francisco because anytime you talk about cities like that in St. Louis, people are like, we're not San Francisco. Like, of course we are not San Francisco. And I think it's worth um, learning from some of the um, research that's happened there. They created a gentrification sort of warning kit. And you know, how can we predict which neighborhoods are gonna start gentrifying next? And how can we intervene before all that displacement happens? And the expansion of public transit was unfortunately um, sort of one of those um, predictors of gentrification. So in St. Louis, where we have a very different, of course, a very different housing market than San Francisco, but we do have gentrification happening here as well. I think it's really important that as we do transportation planning, that we tie it to housing planning and we, you know, protect affordable housing, affordable rental, also affordable home ownership opportunities um, before that gentrification starts happening. So, you know, as we talk about, for instance, North South Metrolink, um, I think, you know, housing definitely needs to be part of that conversation. Thank you. Yeah. And actually in the chat here, I think it's just a host and panelists, like not only thinking about cars, but also just access to food, insurance, banking, um, internet availability, like that somebody just commented on that. And I, I think, yeah, that's a part of the larger landscape. Um, and because you brought up gentrification, um, I did have a question. I'm scrolling back up. Bear with me. I had a question about, um, about like, you know, reverse white flight or gentrification and just your thoughts. It, the question says, is it beneficial to see reverse white flight and bring back middle to high income um, county residents into areas where there are a lot of vacancies? And I mean, I, yeah, so I, I wonder, I wonder what you, what your thoughts are on, on gentrification in St. Louis specifically. Yeah. So, I mean, there's no, I think it's a, I, I don't think it's that controversial to say that we need a stable population to provide basic, you know, city services and things like that. However, um, the return of population doesn't necessarily do that when a lot of it is being done through tax breaks. So, and this is a whole other presentation that I would be so happy to give in this, um, you know, venue or somewhere else, but I've done a lot of work over the years on TIF, that's tax increment financing and tax abatement. So a lot of the gentrification that's happening in St. Louis is not, you know, folks from the county, white people moving into the low density areas, like the disinvested areas, it's moving into the central corridor. So areas like Shaw and um, Forest Park Southeast um, and neighborhoods like that. And a lot of the time that happens um, with the use of tax breaks. So they're moving into single family homes, maybe converting a duplex to a single family home um, and paying the taxes as if the home was never rehabbed. And so, um, and then, you know, it's often, you know, households that are like dual income, no kids, or if they decide to have kids, they don't send their kids to public school, or when their kids get to school age, they move out back out to the county. So how does that benefit um, someone who is, you know, a family living on the north side who is sending their kids to public school? I don't see that logic. For that kind of population sort of rebound or whatever to to actually help um, people need to pay their fair share of taxes so um you know and there's a lot of conversation happening about this in the city you know sort of maybe 
pumping the brakes or at the very least adding transparency to these tax breaks that we're giving out. Um, but unless we can do that, really kind of rein in these tax breaks, then that new population isn't necessarily, you know, it's not really benefiting anything if they're not contributing sort of to the whole. Thank you all so much. We have, well, we're at time. So I'm going to go ahead and end. We didn't get to all the questions. So maybe you all would be willing to come back for another session because this was so information packed. I will just say that a few people have asked if you'd be willing to share your PowerPoint on our website. If, if you are, I can post that. Um, yeah, the it's recording... actually already available on the Center for Social Development's website. So we will easily, no problem at all, we're happy to share all that. Well, there you go. Um, and then today's presentation will be shared, the recording of it. I just put a link to that in the chat on our um, professional development website. So thank you everybody for joining and really thank you, um, Dr. Metzger, uh, Janika, Russell, Mary, and all of your um, the the your fellow colleagues who helped write this policy briefing, and thank you so much for sharing it with us today. A really fruitful conversation, um, and thank you to our attendees with your great 